Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, a very warm welcome to you. So glad you could join us this morning. Uh, uh, to our visitors, a warm welcome to our family here at Christchurch, George. And uh, while folk are still coming in, why don't you just turn around and say hello t- to those around you. Just greet those if you haven't done so already. Well, I must say, we had an interesting 8 o'clock service. Our guest preacher almost nearly didn't arrive. <laughs> but it, so glad he did, and it is so worth it. And uh, we're really looking forward to God's, to hearing from God's word. Welcome to Errol Wagner. He is a great friend of our church. He's been lecturing in Cape Town for... Uh, can we turn this up just a little bit? Oh, there we are. He's been lecturing in Cape Town for a number... Uh, for, for, for a lot now, isn't it? Quite a few years, and he... Now, he still lives in George, but uh, he's mainly in Cape Town these days, so it's great that we could uh, grab hold of him while he's here. So welcome, Errol. So lovely to have you with us. And uh, he said it's, 50, it's been 50 years of ministry that it's never happened that the dates got mixed up, and it's been 27 years for me that it's never happened either. So I was, I was stressing a little bit at the 8 o'clock. I was trying to prepare my message. Um, but it's great to be together, and... Um, and, you know, we, we, we've just been away. Uh, it's synod. And uh, in, in Joburg, you reminded that although today is spring day, uh, in Joburg, it certainly doesn't look like it. Uh, we were there in Joburg this weekend. We, as we know, in George, spring only starts in November. So, um, but, you know, we just praise God for his creation. We see his wisdom. Uh, for those who he's given us eyes to see his power. And uh, spring reminds us as well of... God's grace, a new life in Christ. And uh, at Synod, at the church we're at, there was a sign outside that said this. Imagine someone knowing everything about you and still loving you. God does. And, you know, you know, how is it possible that God would know everything about us, every shameful thought, every shameful action, every shameful word. He knows everything about us. How is it possible that he would still love us? It's not that he doesn't care about us, and it's not that he just sweeps under the carpet. It's only because of his grace through what he did for us in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the, Paul, the Apostle Paul says it, puts it like this in Ephesians 2. He says, we were all de- we were dead in our transgressions and sins in which we used to live. We followed the ways of this world, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature, following its desires and thoughts. We were by nature objects of God's wrath, his judgment, and rightly so. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It's it's by grace that you've been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. And he goes on to say, Now in Christ Jesus, you who are once far away have been brought near through the blood, through the death of Christ. Isn't that great news? You know, he knows everything about us. And yet, because of his grace in Christ, 
He still loves us. He loves us. So come, let us rejoice in that as we stand and sing, Who Alone Can Rescue. Let's rejoice in His amazing grace together.
Amen. Please be seated. Oh, what amazing grace. Let's bow our heads in time of prayer. Our oh, Heavenly Father, we come before you singing your praise, acknowledging that you alone are worthy. You are the creator of all things, the one who holds the universe in your hands, yet cares so deeply for each and every one of us. You are our refuge and our strength, our help in times of trouble. Now, Jesus, we, we thank you. We thank you for the great love you have shown us. You are the only one who could bear the weight of our sins. And you alone could break the chains that bound us. Your sacrifice on the cross has brought us redemption and life. No one else could save us. No one else could lift us from the depths of our sin and despair. We praise you for your amazing grace and mercy. But Lord, we also come before you to confess our sins. We have sinned in our thoughts, in our words, and in our actions. We've tried to save ourselves through our own strength, forgetting that you alone are our saviour. Forgive us, Lord, for the times that we have turned away from you, seeking hope in the things of this world instead of finding our hope in you. We pray, Lord, to change our hearts. <coughs> Help us to remember that it is by your grace alone that we are saved and not by our own efforts. Lead us back to the cross, where your love and mercy are poured out in abundance. We surrender to you, Lord, knowing that you are faithful and just. We put our trust in you alone, our Savior and Redeemer. To you be all the glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Not sure if I said this, but I'm going to say it again. Please don't rush off afterwards. Uh, join us for a cup of tea or coffee and uh, enjoy the fellowship. It's a beautiful day the Lord has given us, and uh, so we encourage you, invite you to stay afterwards. Just some birthdays this week in our church family. Today, uh, uh, tomorrow is Ralph Reed, Tuesday, Louis Bertrand and Susie Mayer, and on Wednesday, Lizanne Farrell. So just remember our brothers and sisters in Christ as they celebrate their birthdays. I just want to say thank you so much for those of you who prayed for us, this, uh, Josh and myself and uh, our denomination as we gathered in uh, at Christchurch Midrand in Joburg uh, for our synod. And it really was a, it was a good time. Uh, it was some great talks and, and uh, just something, you know, we're not the perfect denomination or perfect church and uh, no one is. But I just praise God. The most important things I believe we got right. There's a focus on the word of God, focus on the gospel. And we had some really good uh, really great Bible talks uh, that really challenged us. One of the things that challenged me is that the freedom that we gain from the gospel is not freedom to make us comfortable. It's not freedom that Christ is one so that we can just be comfortable. You know, we have a call upon our lives and let the gospel shape everything we do. And so that's a challenge I just pass on to you as well. Uh, keep, please be praying for our denom. Um, Pray for our new presiding bishop. He's only been in there in, in, since April, and he's still finding his feet, as you can imagine, as he's trying to understand uh, things more from his perspective. And uh, just keep praying that we will be faithful as a denomination uh, to win people for Christ. That you know, we call ourselves Reach South Africa, and I think it's a great. Uh, it holds us accountable. You know, we call to reach South Africa, and that's not just the pastors; it's the church. It's you and me. Uh, may we have the heart of Christ. 
pray for one another in that. Just part of the way we try to share Christ at Christmas, and yes, we're already talking about Christmas, can you believe it, is that uh, every year we put together uh, uh, gifts for the girls at Kids Stop. And, it's, and they ask for toiletries. I mean, things that we take for granted, and this is what they're asking for. And, um, and we use that as a way to really connect and share the love of Christ at, uh, at Christmas. So please, we're looking for face cloth, soap, toothpaste, uh, toothbrushes. Um, if you can help with toiletry bags or making toiletry bags, uh, please speak to Vicki Becker. She's the pianist this today, for those of you who don't know her. Um, and please, those are the things we're collecting. Okay, uh, please uh, don't just bring just anything. Those are the things we, we're collecting. So thank you for those who have brought and uh, if you can help there. And let's be generous as God has been generous to us. Just some dates to diarize. Um, on Saturday the 14th and Sunday the 15th, that's in two weeks, we're going to be grilling a Christian. Have you ever grilled a Christian before? Hmm? I know we good at grilling steak and things like that, but we're going to be grilling a Christian. And our speaker is Grant Retiff. He's, the, the, those of you may remember, Frank Retiff. Uh, he's the son of Frank Retiff. Uh, Grant is the pastor at uh, Christchurch Stellenbosch. And he's going to be with us. He's here coming for a wedding. And we've been able to grab hold of him and uh, get him to, uh, to come and uh, teach th- over the weekend. So on the Saturday morning, we're going to be gathering here from 9 to 11 and uh, the, the subject is, he's going to be talking about, what about other religions? If I were God, I wouldn't only accept Christians. Maybe that's some of what you think. And he's going to be talking about that. And, uh, and it also includes a session where you can ask your burning questions. So it's an opportunity to grill Grant Retiff with all kinds of questions. So I really want to encourage you to come and use this opportunity. Maybe people who think about this as well. You know, oh, it's not just... Jesus, it's uh, you know any other religion. As long as you're sincere and and you think you're good, um, well, these are these are questions that our age has constantly been pumping out to us, and we really encourage you to come along on the Saturday from nine to eleven. Uh, there will be a, a leaflet going on in the WhatsApp group. I encourage you to forward that around. And then on Sunday, at the morning services, he's talking about what about suffering. If I were God, I would remove all the suffering. So maybe that's how you think. So I really encourage you to come and join us. On, uh, for Grilla Christian on, on, in two weeks' time. Also, there's a kids' holiday club, club coming up. I uh, don't know if Esther wanted to speak to it, but uh, here's what it looks like, okay? Heroes Academy Holiday Club, very exciting stuff coming up, and so we hope all boys and girls are going to c- come and bring your friends. It's for grades 1 to 7, um, 9 to 12 of, of the week of the school holiday, so c- make sure you come along for that. But it's also for us as a church family to... To, to be involved. There are all kinds of ways that Esther is asking us to be involved. There's a list on the table just outside in the foyer. And I really encourage you, think about what you can do, not what you can't do. Don't focus on that. Focus on what you can do. And let's come together as a church family and let's really make this something special. And I really encourage you to be praying. This is a great outreach to the children of our community. So please be praying about that. And then, ladies, something for you to keep praying about is on Saturday, the 5th of October, You've got your ladies' spring, spring tea called The Fragrance of Life. And the spe- our speaker is our own Chris Mabardenhorst. And um, we all, they're still needing, uh, the idea is, for those of you ladies who haven't been, is there are tables that are decked out, beautifully done, each with a host who sort of sets out their table in, uh, according to how they uh, enjoy spring and, uh, and how they de- de- uh, decorate things. And we're looking at, the ladies are still looking for hosts. So... Um, so if you can host, ladies, a table, and you can find a little bit more about that, uh, you can speak to Michelle. Um, of course, she's not here today. She's not well. But you can speak to um, any of the ladies' committee here. You can speak maybe Tonya. You could help. If uh, oh, there, where's, where's, where's Melanie? Is Melanie? There's Melanie. Melanie's the one who's overseeing the the um, the hostesses. Sorry about that, Mel. So please speak to Melanie. There's a thank offering box at the back, and we really encourage you to give for the Lord's work here at Christchurch, George, as we seek to reach people for the Lord Jesus. Well, this yesterday we had a very, uh, just a great time. Uh, the men, we had about 110 men get together at uh, Glenwood House School. Uh, and I'm going to ask Dion Buerta to come to the front. Uh, Dion came and shared his story. It was called Guns, Grenades, and the Grace of God. 
I said yesterday I'd never ever thought I'd be advertising anything that had guns or grenades in it. But we did. And you never know. Never say never. And um, it really was a great time. Yesterday was the 2 to 16 version. Um, but I did promise that we're in for the ladies who were, some were a bit upset that we, you weren't invited to come. And maybe next time we'll certainly invite you ladies. But today, and with the children here, we're going to have the PG version of uh, what God has amazingly done by His grace in Dion's life. So, Dion, it's lovely to have you again with us uh, today. And, um, and just, to, just tell us a bit about, introduce yourself. Tell us a bit about yourself, married, children, interests, what do you do for a living? Dion. Thank you, Sean, and good morning to everyone. It's so nice to be back in George. I've been here for four days now and four nights, and I just want to thank uh, the Nightingale uh, family uh, for putting up with me and for Noel, a, a very precious brother in Christ that brought me all the way back, um, all the way here from Durbanville and taking me back again um, later this afternoon. Uh, so I, I do worship in Durbanville at the Reach Church there, um, and that's uh, been since 2019. I came to faith in Christ on Boxing Day uh, 2015. Um, sadly, I'm divorced um, since last year. I've got um, three children and I've got four grandchildren. And um, I love hiking as far as my back will allow. Um, I love road trips. Um, I love uh, the great outdoors, uh, flea markets, reading. And I study uh, quite a bit in my um, pastime on um, Middle East politics and um, trying to stay updated with what's going on in that part of the world. You left out the most important thing. Yeah. Which rugby team do you support? Oh, <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, six decades ago, I was born in Durban, um, moved to Cape Town in 2010, and... Um, but I'm still a shark supporter. <laughs> um, will forever be. Just want to get, yes. that, just want to get yes. that right. Thanks, Sean. Yeah, it's yeah, very yeah, important. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, once you've seen the light, you can't go back. Um, but just tell us a bit about your life, Dion, before you became a Christian. You know, what was your life like? Um, and, uh, yeah, and some of the events that really led up to that point that you came to know Christ. Yeah, so I was raised in the Dutch Reformed Church and um, confirmed um, in my matric year but I only had an abstract um, view and understanding of God and um, who he was. And yeah, um, I spent 14 years in the police um, in two special operations units and was exposed to a lot of violence and human depravity um, in the period 84 to 97 um, during this country's transition from apartheid to democracy. So. Um, the two units that I served in was at the proverbial uh, tip of the spear, so exposed to a lot of violence. Um, 25,000 people unfortunately lost their lives in this country in that short space of time. And um, I then went on to the corporate world. I spent almost eight years there and um, then went to Iraq as a bodyguard and a team leader, project manager, operations director, etc. cetera. Um, spent 18 years there and came back to South Africa about two and a half years ago. And because of um, all the exposure to all the trauma, um, yeah, I, I unfortunately uh, succumbed to alcohol. I became an alcoholic and um, that was my main crutch. And that led to abuse and aggression and um, yeah, shameful, but um, that is what happened. I was very, very bitter, very angry about the past, uh, very arrogant, very boastful, very proud, um, self-gratifying, self-sufficient, self-righteous. I believe that I, I had survived 25 times um, in Iraq and the police where I most certainly should have died, but the Lord saved me. But I didn't see it like that. I saw it as me, myself, I, my own, my own skills, my own um, experience, my own knowledge, etc., uh, etc. Et and um, yeah, in the process I lost um, 35 friends and colleagues and brothers, um, both in the police and Iraq, 10 of them um, due to suicide, um, reckless behavior, um, etc. So yeah, and then in this period, no counseling, 
uh, whatsoever. We had a strict code of silence. We didn't speak about our trauma at all. Uh, it's multi-layer, multiple layers of trauma um, suppressed over many, many years. And, uh, you know, just, uh, I know you, we talked about it with the, the eight o'clock service, just the, just the amount of trauma. I mean, you were talking about uh, the post-traumatic stress and the incidents that you went to, I mean, you went to a psychologist, and just to give us a perspective of really what's gone on. Yeah, at the end of 2014, at the pinnacle of my career, I was a country director for a very large US NGO with a multi-million dollar um, budget, and everything came crashing down. And during um, 2015, uh, I was diagnosed with complex uh, PTSD, and I knew there was something wrong. Um, I saw a psychologist, and she said to me, um, in order to ascertain the severity of your uh, condition, how many traumatic events have you seen, been exposed to, witnessed, and participated in? And I say, uh, and she said, uh, one to five, six to 10, or in extreme cases, more than 10. So I said to her, I was busy writing my memoirs at that stage, and um, they're not, they're just over halfway. And um, I've counted 165. And those were only the main ones, not the minor ones where we would drive in Iraq and be shot at. I don't even count those. Um, yeah, so, yeah. So how did God use all that and, and to bring it to the point of your recognizing that you needed him, you needed Christ? Right. Yeah, we just saying now, amazing grace, and it's just two words that keep on coming up, but God, but God, but God, and his amazing grace. But he had to crush me first. Um, I lost my job in 2014, diagnosed with complex PTSD. My back gave in. I had to have my fifth spinal surgery. Um, I've got about a meter of steelworks in my back to keep me upright. Um, the Lord um, basically took everything away. My wife left me and my children, and um, I drank more and more pity parties with my band of brothers, um, you know, talking about the glorious past and just, um, you know, just being, being, being bitter. And, um, you know, the Lord crushed me. He brought me uh, to the end of me. Um, I was at the precipice. Um, I, I was, it, it was like dark, absolutely dark. I felt absolutely filthy. Um, yeah. And, I knew that I was lost. I knew that it was hopeless and I was helpless within myself. Yeah, last one. Yeah, so um, on, on Christmas Day, I was sitting in my man cave at home and the Lord opened my eyes. He had been prompting me since 2014 into 2015. Even crushing me, he prompted me, drew me unto him. And I kept on declining and I kept on walking away and looking the other way. And um, Christmas morning, I woke up and I was alone at home in my man cave. And where I would sit in that man cave in the past and look at the, uh, my photos and my books and um, commendations and medals, I would glory in myself and say, wow, Dion, you are really amazing, you know? And to my shame, th that's where I was. And that morning, whilst crying out to the Lord and reading the Bible that was lying there, but with half an inch of, of uh, dust gathering, a beautiful leather-bound Bible, never read it. I took it and I just started paging through it, reading through the Psalms and the Proverbs and, and, and. And um, I got to Jeremiah 6, verse 16, and the word of, the God, um, the word of God says, and this is what the Lord says, um, Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and then walk in it. And you will find rest for your soul. <coughs> and I knew that I wasn't addressed. I knew um, I was hostile to God. I was angry with him because he'd taken away so many of my friends that I'd been injured so often. I was really in a bad place. And fear overcame me. And I knew that if the Lord had taken me at that moment, I'd be totally lost. So I sank down on my knees and I begged the Lord and I said to him, I feel so filthy inside. It's like when David prayed in Psalm 51 and 
he said, have mercy on me, Lord, um, by your unfailing love and your great compassion. Wash me, cleanse me. And that's what I felt, so filthy inside and out. And I asked the Lord to cleanse me, to wash me, to take me from the domain of darkness into the wonderful light of Christ's kingdom. And by his amazing grace, he did. And he saved me. And, um, yeah. And his amazing grace alone, and as we've been saying today, it's by grace alone, through faith in Christ alone. Nothing that I contributed. It's a free gift of God. All we have to do is acknowledge him as the Lord and the Savior, the one and only, the way, the truth, and the life. And the light dawned for me. Yeah. And, what, and what difference has Christ made from that day on? Uh, obviously, there. Has it taken away all the consequences of what's happened, of your own sin? Uh, how's he, what has he been doing? Yeah. yeah. So I know that I've been forgiven. I know that the Lord says he has removed it as far as the east is from the west. He remembers it no more. But there are lingering, remaining consequences of sin. And my divorce is one of those consequences through bad behavior. And I take responsibility for that, um, amongst other factors, too. Um, so th there's those consequences that I have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. But I know that I've been set free. I know that I'm forgiven. Um, the Lord has taken away um, about 90% of my PTSD symptoms, but um, he's kept a little bit. And um, I'm reminded of 2 Corinthians 12, where, where Paul says, um, or Paul pleads with the Lord three times, please take away this thorn in my flesh. And w we don't know what that was. But that's how I feel. It's like the Lord has said, no, no, I'll take most, uh, most away, but I'm going to leave some so that you remain dependent on me because my grace is always sufficient. And that's the lesson I've learned. And it's so beautiful to hold on to that truth. Um, he's also, I, I pleaded with him to take away my alcoholism. And three weeks after my conversion, he did just that. And I've been clean and sober for eight and a half years. I know it's going to last until kingdom come because it was wrought by God, not in my own strength. So, yeah, and um, he's given me a, a new family. My, my blood family has abandoned me, uh, but he's given me such a beautiful new family at DCC. Um, yeah, and just all over the place. Um, he has filled my heart with love where I was so rock hard and so full of hate. He's taken that heart of stone out, given me a heart of flesh, and I can love abundantly. And I have a heart for the, uh, for the broken. I have a heart for especially war veterans. Uh, most of my ex band of brothers, I would say 95% are not saved. They're very hardcore. They are where I used to be. Um, so I, I speak with him one-on-one -on -one quite often. And it's hard to break through, and, and I keep on praying, walking with them. So that's my ministry, and that's my focus currently. Um, I feel very passionate about that. Well, praise God. You see, this is the miracle of salvation. And I just wonder, do you know this miracle in your own life? Notice, Dion wasn't talking about religion. You know, he wasn't talking about us trying to be good for God. Because he realized, you know, you can't be. And, you know, really, the details of Dion's story may differ from ours, but this, it's the same. You know, we've all got to come to that point of recognizing that we are lost and helpless without Christ, without his forgiveness. And, um, and I just want to encourage you, if you don't know that salvation, knowing that, uh, that uh, new life, I mean, it's, it really is a miracle. And I really want to encourage you. I would love to speak to you. Come and speak to Dion. You can speak to Errol, I'm sure, as well. Uh, it's amazing how Errol's sermon just links so wonderfully with Dion's testimony as well. Because God's grace is amazing. And we pray that you know that. That's why this church exists. So we're going to pray. And we're just going to just pray for Dion. And uh, let's give thanks. Oh, Heavenly Father, we are amazed at your goodness and your grace. Salvation is an absolute miracle. It's everything that you've done. Thank you for making Dion alive in Christ. Thank you for showing him his great need. And yes, 
crushing him in order to lift him up. Mm. And that's every one of our testimonies. We've all got to go to that point of recognizing that we're helpless and lost mm. without Christ. And won't you do that, Lord, for maybe folk here today who, who can relate so much with what um, you've done in Dion's life. We just thank you for the new birth, the total transformation that only you could have done. And we do pray, Lord, that you just continue to uh, work in Dion's life and use him for your glory. Thank you for what you've done this weekend. And we look forward to an eternity to see how those seeds that have been planted will, will grow. And we'll see men and women and children in Christ because of the good, good news of the Lord Jesus. Mm-hmm. And Lord, I pray for anyone who's here who's, who's, who's still lost. Uh, and you know who they are. Won't you bring them to their convic- to deep conviction of their sin and their need of Jesus? Thank you that in your grace your arms are open wide. We give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm. The children from preschool to grade eight, you can head off to kids' church now, and we're going to stand and declare in in song. There is one gospel, the gospel of the Lord Jesus, and let's stand and let's sing together.
as we pray. <clears throat> Do you stand in the gospel of Jesus Christ? What can take a dying man and raise him up to life again? What can heal the wounded soul? What can make us white as snow? What can fill the emptiness? What can mend our brokenness? What reveals the Father's love? What can lead the wayward home? What can melt a heart of stone? What can free the guilty ones? What can save and overcome? Oh, Heavenly Father, we want to praise and thank you for the power of your one gospel, your momentous news to a rebellious and broken world of grace and salvation through Jesus Christ. Grace and salvation that every single one of us needs your grace and mercy and forgiveness to sinners like us is, is overwhelming. That you would not condemn us as we deserve, but instead give us your son and offer us life and forgiveness and a fresh start, a new beginning in Jesus. Thank you, Father, for your grace that covers all our sins. And for the reminder that in Jesus we have true freedom from guilt and shame. We thank you for the assurance that in him alone we are saved. We are redeemed. And we are made whole. And as we reflect upon your one gospel, we ask you to transform our hearts by your spirit through your word. To live its truth in every area of our lives so that we embody that gospel. Embody your love and compassion to all those around us, in our marriages, in our families, in our church, in our workplaces, in our community. May we grow in our understanding of the depth of your grace and love in the Lord Jesus and the power of your gospel. May we be quick to forgive just as you've forgiven us. And may we extend the same grace to others that you have so graciously given to us. Thank you for the grace and the hope and the joy and the peace we have in Christ. The one who has conquered sin and death for us. May we never lose sight of the one gospel, your gospel. And may it be the foundation upon which we stand and build our lives, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I ask you to take up your Bibles. We're now going to have the Bible reading. Our Bible reading this morning is from the Gospel of John, and we're going to read from chapter 8. And we're going to read there, <coughs> sorry, just get that right, the first 11 verses. <coughs> and you can find that on page 118 of the Supplied Bible. Then each went to his own home, but... Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made a stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap 
in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, if any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. This is the word of the Lord. It's good to be with you again after such a long time. I don't know how long ago. I mean, it feels very long. Well, I don't think any of you were aware of the consternation that took place earlier. There I was having a leisurely breakfast, and, uh, and then the message came through, you should be pre preaching at Reach. And I thought, well, goodness me. Somebody has made a mistake here. <laughs> I don't think it was me. <laughs> it reminded me of something that happened a number of years ago. Um, I don't know if any of you ever heard of Rex Matthew. He was um, the principal of the Baptist College, and um, he loved repairing cars. And one Saturday, he was under his Jaguar, an old Jaguar that he was busy repairing and um, they came out, I don't think he had a cell phone in that time, I think his wife came out and said, do you know that you should actually be presiding at a wedding now? <laughs> now imagine he had his overalls on, his hands were dirty and he had no time to do very much more than just wipe his hands. But in those days, fortunately, in those days, fortunately, even Baptist ministers used to wear black gowns. So it was easy. He just put on his black gown over his overall and there he went and he was, was preaching. But fortunately, uh, it wasn't as, as bad as that. Well, I've been amazed just to listen to the uh, Dion's message and his testimony and then the things that uh, Sean has been emphasizing to see the way it ties in with what I want to speak about this morning. Um, I don't know if you know Alistair Begg. Any of you know Alistair Begg? You listen to him? He's really somebody worth listening to. Um, I think he's a Presbyterian minister. I won't hold that against him. But um, he's an outstanding preacher, um, preacher with great compassion. And uh, last year, I think it was in the end of last year, he, um, he caused quite a consternation. A, a grandmother phoned him and uh, said to him she was faced with a very delicate and difficult situation. Her granddaughter, whom she loved dearly, had a very special relationship and bond with her granddaughter. Granddaughter was getting married and she didn't know what to do. The problem was that she was getting married to another good woman. So this grandmother asked, what should I do? Should I go to that wedding? I don't want to break my relationship with her. I've told her that I don't agree with what she's doing and that it is sin. But I don't want to break my relationship with her. So what shall I do? And so they discussed it and eventually, and Mr. Begg, in his wisdom, he said to her, you go and attend. <coughs> she knows where you stand, but go and attend. Don't break your relationship with her and give her a wedding present, give her a Bible. 
And that's what he said she should do. It caused such consternation amongst the evangelical leaders uh, around the world, particularly in America. <coughs> Some of the real good men, very good men, um, condemned him and wondered whether he had now begun to move on this very important issue, which he hadn't actually. He hadn't moved at all. But he was concerned about that grandmother and he was concerned that that grandmother could have influence in her granddaughter's life eventually. That whole thing saddened me tremendously when I thought, how do you jump into the into judgment without understanding what was going on, understanding the dynamics of what was going on. This first my, first my what I've realized about the gospel, it's sometimes in the grace of God that sometimes faces us with very shocking things. And we're going to be looking at a very shocking story this morning. It's been read to you in John chapter eight. So my title of my message this morning is Grace versus Obedience or Transforming Grace. You see, folk, yes, the Bible places a great deal of emphasis on grace. We know that. That's the gospel. And we need to, as Christians, constantly, as Luther used to say, we need to preach the gospel to ourselves every day of our lives, every day. We then need to realize that it's by grace alone. But having said that, the Bible does maintain a balance between grace and obedience. We must never, ever forget that balance. Although we are saved, we know by grace. We are not saved by our obedience. But the fruit of our salvation, the fruit of God's grace, is a different life. Not perfection, not perfection. I think as um, John MacArthur said, it's not perfection, it's direction. The direction of my life changes. And that's why faith and repentance always go together. It means turning away from our former way of a life of sin to faith in what Christ has accomplished on the cross for me as the only way of getting right with God. And you will find that stressed again and again in the New Testament, this balance between grace and obedience. Let's take a doctrine that really shows us something what grace really is, and that is the doctrine of election. That God in his sovereignty chose me, chose you if I'm a believer, chose me before he even created the world to set his love upon me, to save me, when I'd done nothing. But he, in his inscrutable mercy, decided not looking down through the ages of time and seeing that maybe I would turn to him. No, no, in you, if he left me, I would never turn to him. But he chose me to save me. And this is the way it puts it. So that's grace. But listen to the way Paul puts it. For those whom he foreknew, that means set his love upon beforehand, he's predestined, that means he had a goal for them. And what was that goal? To be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. In other words, he chose me. And his goal for me is that I, and the reason why he saved me, that I would in actual fact become like his son, more like his son. That's what salvation is. Paul puts it like this. For he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. That is right through the scripture, my dear friends. When you come to, for example, to being born again, regeneration. John puts it like this in his first letter. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. It doesn't say that we can't sin but makes a practice. It's a, it's a way of life. Why? Because God's seed abides in him. He cannot keep on sinning because he's been born of God. And constantly, remember that in Ephesians, Paul says, we've been saved by grace so that we might do good works. 
And of course, we know that our obedience, our very obedience, our very striving, our very love for God, as weak as it may be, it is, doesn't originate in my, in my will. It originates in the spirits working within me. That he puts his seed within me. He changes me. He gives me a new heart. And the only reason why I live and the way I do live is because of the work of his grace within me. It's not human effort. If I, Paul could say, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. All right? That's obedience. Why? Because God works in us to will and to work his good pleasure. That's the only reason. My dear friends, that's what the gospel is all, around, all about. I, I have summarized this over the years with this formula. The Christian life, I live the Christian life by resting in the finished work of Christ. And that you understand. I rest not in my goodness, not in my achievements, not in my commitment. I rest purely and simply, not even on my faith. I rest purely and simply on the finished work of Christ. And then, daily, I rely upon the continuing, transforming work of the Holy Spirit. Do you understand what I'm talking about? And it's all from God. And that principle comes out very clearly in this rather shocking story. Now you've noticed that. You look at your NIV or you look at your Bible, you'll see that chapter 8 verses 1 to 11 is almost there in hakis. It's in brackets. And uh, <clears throat> that causes people great problems um, because in actual fact, if you come to the end, in chapter 7, Jesus is speaking in the, in, he's speaking in the temple. That's what the context is. And, he, the, 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 Jew, the Jewish leaders are antagonistic to him. And then suddenly, by, by the way, and then that context, that story, Jesus confronting the, the Pharisees and the leaders, continues from verse 12 of chapter 8. So right in the middle there, there is this, verses 1 to 11, a story that looks as though it's out of place. Now that brings us to the whole question of the way in which the Bible was put together. Because don't forget that John, he obviously wrote this gospel. There's nobody that, there's no, no uh, evangelicals who doubt the, the, the authenticity of that story. But um, when John wrote, he, we, we don't have the original document that he wrote. So when they brought the Bible together, there was a, a bit of a problem to put this all together. And so some scholars say, well, you see what happens when they put this all together. And they, they knew the story was true. They had to find a place to fit it in. Uh, I, I don't think that's true. I think there's a very good reason why John puts it here. It is an interruption. There's no question. And you can, the NIV acknowledges that it is an interruption. But you see, I think what, what John is doing is that we've, the context has been that Jesus has been confronting or the Pharisees have been rejecting him. And they are hard men. They're good men. They're moralistic men. Very religious men. But they're hard. As legalistic people, as self-righteous people are, very critical. So, in that context, John wants to draw a contrast between Jesus and these Pharisees. Because the one is religion, there's the Pharisees, and the other is Christianity. And so he draws the contrast, and he shows, and that's why he brings the story in. It's almost as though it's, it's an intrusion, but in fact, I don't believe it's just an intrusion. He's drawing the contrast between what, the, the one and the other. Understand. So let's look at that passage itself. It, it's it's like, almost like a, a play. And because what it does do, my dear friends, it brings us to understand what the gospel looks like in a specific situation. Because we can talk about the gospel. We can, we can theologize about the gospel. We, but when it comes down to what Alistair Begg faced, we, we don't know whether we really 
can be too happy about this whole thing. It's just like Paul when he wrote Romans and he comes to chapter 6 of Romans and, he's, and somebody says to him, Paul, you're talking so much about God's grace and so on and not about the law and not about our works and not about our goodness. So are you actually saying to us that we can sin? Because you're actually saying it's not because of my good works, to put it quite bluntly. Nothing I did warranted God's salvation. I agree with that. Do you agree with that? Nothing. And nothing you do, nothing you do will unearn God's salvation. Do you understand that? That's rather shocking, isn't it? Is that saying like you can go and live as you please? That's what they concluded. I remember Martin Lloyd-Jones saying that you, if, if people never accuse you of that as you preach the gospel, you haven't preached the gospel, you haven't understood the gospel. Well, this story shows us something of what it is. So you notice there are three groups of players in this story, three. There's the adulterous woman, there's the religious leaders, and the Lord Jesus Christ. And you can see that it's, it's a disturbing story. Deep emotion. This terrible shame of this poor woman. And the callous condemnation of the religious leaders and then the strange response of Jesus Christ. So notice three points. The serious sinful act of this woman. The serious sinful act of this woman. Secondly, the questionable motives of the religious leaders. Oh, I can put it this way. The sinful motives of the religious leaders. And thirdly, the grace that forgives and transforms. Now notice in chapter 7, the first point, the serious act of the sinful woman, the sinful, serious sinful act. Chapter 7 ends like this, and they went to their own houses, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. And then in chapter 8, verse 2 to 4, we read, and very early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. And, and while Jesus is teaching them, the scribes and Pharisees interrupt him. Verse 4, and they bringing this woman. They say, teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. <laughs> now you must get this point. Understand it. This woman is disheveled. disheveled. Perhaps her clothes aren't as it should be. Because she was in the act of having sex with another man right there. And they caught her in that act. So they take her drag her down the street. And they all can see it. They can understand. You see, they've been spying on her. That reminds me of the bad days of the past. Remember, you, those of us who are older, understand that terrible act called the Immorality Act. Do you remember that? Do you still remember the Immorality Act? When the police would spy on anyone who dared to have sex across the color line. And they would swoop down on the person and take them. And the shame of that was too terrible. And, and a number of Germanies were caught. And, they, and the headlines were, you know, whenever that happened, of course, you know, the, the media went to town. And a number of these men who were caught. And I'm not saying what they did was right. It wasn't right. But what was being done to them was also not right. And no, a number of them committed suicide. And I think these Pharisees were a little like that. It was, to me, very ironic. The very church now that's, that sees no immorality in what the Bible regards as immorality in those days were part of another law that was not biblical at all, really. So if you look, if you read the Gospels, you realize that there were many, many times when the, when the religious leaders, the Pharisees and scribes, were always trying to catch him out. And you, the scribes were experts. They were theologians. They were I interpreters of the Torah. The Pharisees were well known for their, their, their observance of the law. They were highly moral people. And so the question about this woman committing adultery was a bad one. It was serious. No question about it. It wasn't fornication. That means having sex outside of marriage. This was a woman who was married. 
and um, and yet she was unfaithful to her husband. And you picture the scene, my dear friends. It was violent. They put PG on that. It, it was on the television. It's not hard to imagine the terrible shame and the fear. Put yourself in the shoes of this poor woman. She's flung down before Jesus. Her clothes in disarray. Violently thrown in the ground. And now sin is made public. Teacher, we found this woman in the very act of adultery. And we're not expected to underestimate the seriousness of the sin. It was against the Ten Commandments. And so, in that sense, the religious readers were right. So, John is not minimizing her sin. She was guilty. She knew she was guilty. Jesus knew she was guilty. That's why Jesus is later on going to sin no more. But, of course, there was in those days a hierarchy of sins. Sexual sin was the worst. And of course, woman's sexual sin was far worse than men's sexual sin. That's why the question really is, yeah, where was the man? I don't see him there. It takes two to do this thing, you see. But that was the way they saw sin. Some sins were worse than other sins. And men's sins were not so bad. You know what you expect, but women's sins was terrible. So really, she knew she was facing being stoned. That's what the, the Lord said, stoning. She had to be executed. Publicly she'd be stoned. And so you can imagine the shame that she must have felt. And the fear. So again, I want to say to you, friends, John is not trying to minimize this sin. It is extremely serious. She was married. Think of the consequences to her husband, unfaithful. Think of the consequences to her children. We don't know, but we can imagine very possibly. Because my dear friends, our sins have devastating consequences. And Dion spoke about that. And even though God forgives us, he gives us the grace to deal with consequences. So there were consequences. There are no private sins that it affects other people. And so that brings us to the motives of these religious leaders. Do you think that they were right in what they did? Do you notice that there's something? Because John tells us that there was something wrong in what they were trying to do, not in accusing of adultery, but what was in their minds. Because they were not out to lynch the woman. Do you notice? this? Do you realize that? They weren't out to lynch the woman. They were out to lynch who? Jesus. That was it. Ultimately, Jesus was the one on trial. So they did see her as a human being, they used it as a trap to catch Jesus. Get nothing about her person. And so they come to Jesus and they respectfully say, teach her. They acknowledge his authority. And so they present him with this problem, you see. So they say in verse 5, Now in our law Moses commanded us to stone such. What do you say about this? And just in case you missed the point, look at verse 6. He's, they said this so that they might have something to accuse him of. Remember, he's facing a difficult problem here. Is he going to be show no compassion? It's a stoner, as the law says. But then he'd go against the Roman law because the Romans would not give them the, the, the permission to do that. So he'd break the law. Or are you going to say, well, forgive her? And then they can accuse him of being light on the law of God. So where was what she what was he going to do? So they try to discredit him, you see. So the question really is how would Jesus respond to that? Very difficult situation. Would he fall into the trap? Now notice our Lord's response. Very strange, isn't it? Look at verse six, the last part of verse six. He stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger. What do you think he wrote? What do you think he wrote? Anybody guess? If you did guess, your guess is wrong. <laughs> we don't know. It's irrelevant what he wrote. The point is that Jesus did not immediately respond. Look at verse 7. But when they continued asking him, he looked up and said to them, He who is without sin, 
let him cast the first stone. And again, he ignored them. Jesus is giving them time to think of what they've said. And in verse 7, they continue to ask him. And he looks at them in the, in the eye. You, sir. You have never, ever lusted after another woman. You do it. You have never hated anybody. You do it. You have never shown anger. You have never been dishonored. You do it. Those of you without sin. So Jesus turns the tables on them, you see. And of course, uh, too interesting, <laughs> verse 9, and the oldest, it was from the oldest that began to disappear. Maybe they were old enough. When you're old, you don't have any more, any more, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, you, you realize that you, you're weak. So that's what happens. And so Jesus puts his finger on the problem. And remember what Jesus had said already, that it's not the outward act that's the problem, is it? I, I, I can control the outward, outward act. I can. I mean, let's take the AA, AA. You follow the AA rules, you can actually control your, your drink. So we can apply self-discipline to ourselves and appear to be good people. That's what the Pharisees did very often. The problem, my dear friends, the thing that I do not have control over is not the question of my behavior. The thing I... I don't have any control over are my thoughts, my heart. I mean, let's think of it. Let's think of it. I'm driving down the road. I'm driving down York Road, wherever it may be, and, and somebody cuts in front of me. And so what happens? What's going in my mind? What do I want to do? You tell me. Because my immediate reaction is, I'll give him the finger. Or I'll come behind him and, you know, push him. And I must make him understand he's done something bad. But then I suddenly remember, wait a bit, wait a bit. I'm a Christian. And I'm a show of love. And I must pray for him. But you see, the problem is you've already committed a sin, haven't you? Haven't you? That first thought, that first thought of anger, that was the sin. And then, because I'm a Christian, I say, no, I mustn't do that. But the sin has been committed already. You see, I have no control over my heart, and that's what Jesus is saying to these, these men. You without sin, you caught this, this woman in an act of sin, but what about you? Remember, Jesus said this in Matthew 15, do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from where? From the heart. It is from the heart that come evil thoughts and murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and slander. My dear friends, that's your problem and that is my problem. And so John tells us that they move and then Jesus is left alone with his woman. And then this brings me to a very shocking part of the story. I think it's shocking. Initially. Because note what Jesus says. He does it begin with a lecture. Does it begin tell her, telling her that she was very bad in doing what she did? Begin to admonish her. Is that what he does? Understand? Does he condemn her? Because in actual fact, he's the only man in the whole world that could condemn her. Because he was sinless. And he's the man who, he's the one who actually wrote the Ten Commandments. So he's the only one who could condemn her. But notice what he says, and it's shocking. Jesus standing up and saw her and said, Woman, where are your accusers? Did no one condemn you? No one, Lord. And Jesus says, Neither do I condemn you. Go away and sin no more. Do you think Jesus was soft on sin? 
You think Jesus was ignoring his sin? But he, he's treating it with compassion. He's treating a complete contrast is there to see the way in which the Pharisees treated it. But Jesus, you see, it's the difference between Christianity and religion. Vast, vast, vast difference. She's guilty. Jesus knows he's guilty. So how could Jesus say to this woman, neither do I condemn you? She's standing there, my dear friends. Picture the scene. Jesus, they, she's standing there before God. She doesn't totally realize it. Afterwards, she would have. She's standing before God. She's standing before the pure, holy Son of God. And he says, I do not condemn you. He's the only one. You see, the question really is, how can this be? How can it be? He wasn't taking this in lightly. Because he says, go and sin no more. You see, there's something that's implied here that isn't told us. There's something that's going on. That John wants us to go back and read the gospel to see what's going on there. Because Jesus is the one who actually, this question of sin and grace, which cannot be reconciled by you and me, we cannot reconcile that. There's only one place where you can reconcile the awfulness of sin and the wonder of grace. There's only one place where that can be reconciled. And it's an awful story. It's at Calvary. My dear friends, we want to see the horror of sin. We want to see the filth and the depravity of sin. We want to see how God hates sin. He does. God has never, ever become light on sin. He hates sin with a holy wrath. Our God is consuming fire. So, how must this be reconciled? It can only be reconciled by dear friends. As Isaiah says, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement that brought us peace was upon him. All we like sheep have gone astray. And God has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. You see, as, he, as she stood there, before, he was before God, Christ, with all her shame and guilt and filth, Jesus had already made the provision for her that he would take that sin, the filth and that adultery, and that he would pay the price that he could say to her, no, I do not condemn you. You see, because I will take your condemnation. Paul puts it like this. He became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. Does that remind you of another story, another shocking story? There's another shocking story. And that's the thief on the cross. I mean, that. if, 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 if there's any story that actually brings me to the very essence of what grace is, it's that story. Because you see, the thief never went and lived a good life afterwards. Never. He died. He died. He couldn't live a good life. He never went to church, of course. He never went to the synagogue. He never read his Bible. Never did. This man, I think Alistair Beck puts it very beautifully. He says, this man comes to the, to the gates and Peter says to him, well, let me look at your book. You've never been to church. You weren't baptized. Um, you, you, you never did any good thing. I mean, you're a bad man. You're a very bad man. And you murdered people. You're corrupt. And you, you want to come into you want to come to heaven? How can I do this? And uh, the man says, I don't know. But all I know is this: that the man in the middle said I could. Do you remember that? That's what faith is, my dear friends. Faith is nothing. Faith is nothing in my hand I bring. He had nothing. 
He had nothing. He had nothing. All he had was sin. His filth. That's all he had. So he becomes sin for us, so that I might become the righteousness of God. And that tension, my dear friends, between grace and sin can only be on the cross. And that's the gospel. Have you ever realized how different Christianity is to every other religion? If you think, my dear friends, that anything you've done, that anything you've done can actually merit forgiveness, you do not understand the gospel. I have got to realize that when I've been a Christian for 50 years or 60 years as I have been, when I realize that even all of that, all that time, there's not one good thing I've done in relation to God. Nothing. I still have dirty hands. I still have an impure heart. And that's why I can go nowhere else. I can only throw myself on the mercy of God. I can only come to him and say, thank you, God, that you so loved the world that you gave your only begotten son that ever believes in him should not perish, have eternal life. And I need to know that, my dear friends. I need to every day, because you, even when you've been a Christian for years and years, you are still not what you should be. And let me just say that, that, that as we get older, our sins just change, that's all. They just change. We still sin. We may not be doing the sins we committed when we were 25 or 30 and so on, but our sins are still there. What's worse than self-righteousness? What's worse than pride? And What's worse than cantankerousness? What's worse than stubbornness? What's worse than trying to control our children? What's worse than... Ah, understand. They're in our hearts. And so every day of my life, my dear friends, I realize that I wake up in the morning and I, I, I have a desire to, 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 to love God. I have a desire to follow him. I have a desire to obey him. But then my wife's a little late with my breakfast and I get a bit angry. Or whatever it may be. Or maybe I didn't turn the let the, put the toilet lid down or something like that. She felt angry with me. It's there. Our sins are still there because they're in our hearts. And so, my dear friends, and the one thing is we must be very careful of jumping into moral judgment about other people. We easily do that. And we forget what's going on here. That's why we, those who have forgiven much, need to forgive much. Understand that? All those little things, those petty things. I mean, I'm living in Blue Mountain and, and I, we've got a Blue Mountain group and there's always constant grumbling on the, on the WhatsApp group about little things. And I think, what in the world was going on with you? These little nonsensical things and the scheme of things, what do they mean? What do they actually stand for? but we are always ready to jump on other people and condemn them. And we do that, my dear friends. We condemn them. We look at the world and we say, look how bad it is. Yes, it's bad, bad, bad. But what do you expect? What do you expect from the world? What do you expect from unbelievers? What do you expect? Pigs are pigs. It's in their nature. A pig acts like a pig. I've told you the story before. If you, if you want to see the difference between a, a, a believer, the, the, the analogy is the pig. Well, you know, you mean you could, maybe you want to have a pig as a, as a pet. I know some people do that. They're strange. But uh, <laughs> you have a pig as a pet and you take it out and you, maybe you get the little piglet and you then begin to look after it and you have it walking around, the, around your house and your lounge and so on. You clean it and you wash it and then one day, one day, it gets out and there's a pig sty in the air. And guess what that pig does? What's it do? 
it goes to heaven. <laughs> it goes to heaven. It jumps into that muck and filth and stick, stink and it rolls around and loves it. And you run after it. No, no, that's, that's natural for the pig. It's got a pig nature. And you run after that pig. And you try and catch it and you slip. And you fall in all that filth and that muck. And what's the first thing you do? Enjoy you enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> There's something wrong with you. <laughs> the first thing you do is go and have a shower and clean and all, so on. Because you're not a pig. It's not in your nature. But you see, for the unbeliever, and I'm not being disrespectful of the unbeliever, but the unbeliever acts the way he does simply because that's the way he or she, that's what they are. But we are different. We have a different nature. That's why when John says, those who have the seed of God don't continue to sin. So my dear friends, I want to say to you again, when we come to this story, we see something what really, what the, the essence of the gospel is. We are this woman. We are the ones who are standing before the holy God and with all my sin and that's exactly what's going to happen to you and to me one day when we stand before him. And you know, you know as Sean said that God knows all about us. There's nothing that I can hide from him. It is all transparent. It's there before him. And yet, he is the one in all his holiness who says, neither do I condemn you. Can you imagine the wonder and the relief of hearing the God of the universe saying to you, I don't condemn you. And the only reason is because standing, and I'm using an analogy, standing next to me is the sinless son of God who died for me. That is the gospel. So my dear friends, let me reiterate what Sean said. Have you understood that gospel? Has that gospel penetrated your own mind, your own heart, that you realize that nothing in your hand you bring, nothing, nothing, simply to your cross, his cross I cling. That's where my hope is. And I preach that gospel, my dear friends, every day. Preach your gospel every day. And particularly when you have fallen and when you've sinned, when you've failed, as we all do, preach that gospel to yourself. It's not by works. It's by grace alone. Amen. Let's pray. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. We thank you that we have cleansing for our sin and our filth. We have one who stood in our place. One who took the punishment and the penalty that we deserve. And so we glory in the Lord Jesus Christ alone. We thank you that you, through your Holy Spirit, that you've opened our eyes to see reality, to see that there's only one hope, and that's in Jesus Christ. And when we stand before you one day, O oh God, at the last day, we will sing the same song. You are worthy to receive honor and power and glory. For not only did you create us, but you've redeemed us. So we thank you, O oh God, that your long-suffering and kindness has been extended to us sinners. And again, we would pray, Lord, if there are any who have never, ever tasted and seen the Lord is good, has never, ever seen, we're still trying to work with the salvation, hoping that somehow or other they can balance the books, that they may come alone with empty hands and cause themselves to fall before you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.